So let's talk about DAWs. Now, you all know that I have grown up using Pro Tools. Um, I went from tape to Pro Tools. To be honest, it was liberating for me because as a guitar player predominantly, I was always very envious of keyboard players who could edit their MIDI. Pro Tools came out in the 90s and I could edit my guitar playing in the same way that keyboard players could edit their MIDI. It was huge, it was a big, big deal. Being able to get in there and like move a snare drum around and it was, for the longest time, the only game in town. Now I've grown up using it, meaning it's second nature to me. I know all the shortcut keys, I can move around really, really fast without even trying. Now there are three levels that they do. They do a 999 artist model, which has up to 32 tracks that you can do it. And that's basically, you know, $10 a month. There's a studio version, which has, I think, 512 tracks, which is $32, $31.99. And then for those of us like myself that run HDX systems, it's $100, but you get 2,058 tracks or something like that, don't quote me on it, but you get more tracks than you could ever deal with. I mean, to be honest, 512 is more than I've ever used in my entire life. But I suppose if you're doing a film scoring session and you want to mic every single thing and you want the ability to be able to move from track to track just by scrolling down or creating groups, then yeah, there's probably people at a very, very high level professionally in the film composition world and film scoring world that probably love unlimited tracks. 2,000 tracks in my world is unlimited. Um, now, Apple have Logic, and what lots of people love about Logic is $199.99. That's $200. That's it. It's a one-time payment. I don't know if they charge for upgrades, but as far as I know, they don't. So $200, and you get it all in. And there's a lot of people that absolutely love Logic for that reason. Studio One, they have multiple ones. They have the artist version, which is equivalent to obviously the artist in Pro Tools, and that's 100 bucks, it's 99.95. There's a professional, which is $400, $399.95. Then there's the Personas or Presonus Sphere, which is a $15, $14.95 a month, or you can buy it yearly at $164.95. Now, FL Studio, you may remember as Fruity Loops. And when I first started out, it was a standalone software that could edit things really, really, really well. Ableton did the same kind of thing. That was a standalone software. Now they have four different versions. They have Fruity, which I presume is the entry level, which is $99. They have the producer version, which is $199. The signature, $299. And then the all plugin edition, which I'm assuming comes with all of the plugins they do for $499. Digital Performer is something you may remember if you're like my age group, if you're a Gen Xer or you will remember the Digital Performer for the longest time was the scoring platform. Every single guy and girl that I knew that was scoring and doing huge arrangements used Digital Performer. It might well be still the same one. It's $495, and I still think for a lot of people in that world, it's an industry standard. It has been very, very well known for all of the ability it had for printing out scores, for, for controlling MIDI, you know, yeah, I'd still get people sending me stuff that they've mocked up in Digital Performer. Cubase, of course, is massive. Many, many people in Europe that I work with use Cubase before any other DAWs. Um, growing up in the very late 80s and 90s, it was a leader in MIDI sequencing. It was insane. And from they still come from that basis of really being incredible in that world. So many, many people who work on EDM and stuff like that love it. But for instance, Christian Kohler, a great friend of ours who does metal production, uses Cubase. So it's now doing really, really well. It has been for many years in audio editing as well as all the mini stuff. So it's a very, very flexible software, a very, very flexible DAW. They have three levels. They have the elements at 100 bucks, 99.99, artist at 329.99, and the pro version at 500 and $79.99. So it's very comprehensive. Ableton Live. Now Live is something that a lot of EDM producers I know use because you can manipulate sound in such a unique way. You can take a dog bark and turn it into a snare drum. I've heard all kinds of stuff. My friend Chris Lake took a piece of like a Marvin Gaye song. I think it was like a whoop whoop and took it, made it the kick, made it the snare drum, made it the shaker, made it this, made it the that. You can manipulate sound so dramatically using live. The live standard is $449, live suite is $749.
So many, many of you use Reaper. And of course, our good friend Adam Steele is a Reaper user. So we're going to talk a little bit about that with Adam. Now, there are many, many DAWs out there. I do not want to feel like we're neglecting anybody on this. Bitwig is something that comes up a lot. I actually was lucky enough three or four years ago to go to Berlin and go to um, Superbooth and meet the guys behind Bitwig there and had a great conversation with them. Um, that's something that's bundling with lots of other softwares because it has an amazing ability to do arrangements and things, and it's huge. Many people like it. Um, so Bitwig is one to look out for. Reason, of course, is very, very popular. And again, another standalone software that I remember using inside of my DAW. So you can check that out. Of course, there's Nuendo by Steinberg as well. There's so many other ones. Please let us know what your DAW is, and I'd love to know more. This is a perfect opportunity for us to have a conversation about our DAWs below. And of course, wanting to know a little bit more about what computer you use. Do you use a PC? Do you use an Apple? What uh, operating system are you running it on? So what we're going to do is we're going to reach out to people who use these particular DAWs and ask them reasons why they use them. Hi, I'm Adam Steele and I am a Reaper user. I've been using Reaper for almost 15 years at this point. It's something that's been a part of my life almost half my life. It's something that I rely on every day. It's incredibly powerful. It will run on just about anything as well. I mean, I've got this uh, Steam Deck here. I just ran Reaper on it. MacBook, Reaper, PC, Reaper. My Raspberry Pi can run Reaper. And you don't need any special copy protection to run it either. Um, it, there is a 60 day trial, but after that, if you need it for some emergency, it will just keep working. It's incredibly stable and can run hundreds of your favorite third party plugins, VSTs, Logix AUs, all that kind of stuff. Um, they've always been ahead of the curve as well. Things like folders that Pro Tools just got Reapers had forever. The scripting that you can do is super powerful. I actually have my copy of Reaper hooked up to a Dynamount, which is kind of a, you know, the, the robot arm that can move your microphone around in such a way that it can send signals move the Dynamount separately and then just keep repeating with a script. And that's all inbuilt. If you don't like the way it looks, you can change the way it looks with themes. You can change anything. If the keyboard bindings don't work for you, you can change it to work better for you. You can change just about anything if it isn't ideal. And if it is ideal, I run it pretty much stock. Then it's also super fast because it takes all the best bits of all the other DAWs, like li little things like the folders were originally kind of borrowed from Cubase. There's a little neat trick where if I want to record on like 10 different drum microphones, I click arm record on one and go whoop across them all and they just do it. Those nice little things that the developers have gone, that's cool, we should do that. That's cool, we should do that too. They're all in there and it works for me much like an analog desk on a screen. Super useful, can't live without it. Hey everyone, I'm Sanjay C. I use Ableton Live these days, but I didn't always. I actually made the switch from Logic to Ableton Live when I started my YouTube channel. I did it because I wanted a fresh new approach to making music, something that got me out of my comfort zone. Here are a few things I love about Ableton and some tricks you may not know. Ableton can be used in a traditional timeline view for recording, but there's also something called the session view, which makes Ableton really unique. And session view is great for jotting ideas or even creating full performances with controllers. You can record audio straight into clips or even drag in a sample. Record in your MIDI part. And it's gonna keep looping everything. Add in some drums. You can combine different clips into different scenes and then trigger them while Ableton keeps everything in time.
Session View is so powerful. You don't need to be intimidated by it. Just try it. It's so good for experimentation and creating music fast. Ableton has a great way of managing its own stock plugins, instruments, and effects, and a really effective way of grouping them and then creating custom controls to automate everything. Ableton has a lot of tricks up its sleeve and there's tons of tricks you can learn from my channel. Hey, channel plug. Here's a quick one. You can take any sample. Let's take the sample of chords. Remember, this was just an audio file. We can ask Ableton to convert this into a MIDI harmony or melody. Since these are chords, I'll choose harmony and let's see what it does. And now we have the MIDI notes extracted from that audio sample. Magic. Simpler is another super easy and powerful way to use your samples. Just drop in a sample, Ableton can chop it automatically by transient, and then you can play the chops on your keyboard. Let's record that in. Listen, in the end, the DAW that works for you is the one you're most comfortable with, but it doesn't hurt to get out of your comfort zone every now and then and give something new a try, like Ableton Live. I have been in love with Cubase. I have been, let's call it married to Cubase since the late 90s or something. I started out with an Atari and Cubase synced to two ADATs. So I was doing all my MIDI work on an Atari and that's how I got to know Cubase. Later on, I even worked at another studio where they had a very, very early hard disk recording on an Atari Falcon, uh, eight track hard disk recording with uh, Cubase audio. Yeah, and then I switched to PC, to Windows 98, I think. And that's when I started using Cubase VST. And I have tried other DAWs, but I always came back to Cubase. And these days, and for the last 15 years, all the three control rooms here at Cola Killer Studio and also our mobile rigs are fully Cubase and Cubase only. And you know what? Back in the days, I couldn't afford a Pro Tools rig. And all the professional studios were like, ah, you got Cubase, poor you. But you know what? I have always been very happy about that. Um, not only is Steinberg and Cubase stronger than ever today, and especially over here in Europe, a lot of people, a lot of musicians use Cubase these days. So it's um, very easy to work together. It has always been a wonderful bridge between what used to be professional audio editing software like Pro Tools and Soundscape and, and Sonic Paris and all those programs you have already forgotten and the more creative media oriented world uh, programs like Logic and others. So Cubase has always been a bridge between those more creative programs for making music and professional audio editing suites in between. I could do anything basically and that's what i've always enjoyed about cubase i have never looked back and these days everybody's using cubase and cubase is what i recommend both for musicians and for studios cubase is great thanks bye bye hey guys it's aj from hazard sound here i've been using reason here in the studio for over 20 years well actually since the 90s because it started its life out as rebirth which was a software emulation of the famous Roland machines such as the 808, 909 and the TB303. As a user of many DAWs here in my studio, Reason has always stayed as one of my main music creation tools. It has a ton of features that I love and it just keeps getting better and better after every upgrade. So let me show you Reason and a few of my favorite features. So Reason is divided up into browser, Mixer, Rack, and Sequencer windows with the control panel down the bottom. It also has a cool tutorials window. 
to help you get started. In the browser, you can easily see the instruments and effects, etc., that you need. And it also comes loaded with a heap of sounds to get you started creating music. One of the reasons I like Reason over a lot of other doors is the mixer. It's based on and even looks like the famous SSL mixing console, complete with input gain section, compression and gate, EQ, insert effects, and of course the famous stereo bus compressor. Next, I like the flexibility and open routing of the Reason Rack. It allows you to virtually stack instruments, effects, utilities, and players in the rack and patch them all together however you want. Like in the real world. Reason has gone through many changes since it came out, and when the Reason Rack plugin was released, it increased its flexibility here in my studio exponentially. It meant that I can now have all the Reason sounds and effects that I love in other doors that I might be working with with clients, etc., without interrupting my creativity. Reason has a great sequencer with pitch correction and also with the Combinator. You can combine any devices to create your own instrument and effects and build your own plugins. I would definitely recommend Reason to anyone as a complete music making machine. Thanks for watching. Hi guys, Danny Byrne here. I'm a producer, mixing and mastering engineer based out of LA. I've been a Logic user now for over 13 years. And while I do use Pro Tools, FL Studio, and Ableton regularly, Logic is by far the best for me when it comes to speed and efficiency, especially while mixing. So I'm gonna walk you through some of my favorite features now and I uh, hope you like the video. So easily one of my favorite features about Logic is take folders. If you've never seen take folders before, then you're used to comping things sort of like this. What I have here is nine takes of a verse. These are vocals. If you haven't heard of take folders before, or if you haven't used them before, then your comping process might look something like this. And then once you get to this point, you need to clean up all the lines. You have to make sure all these tracks connect. You have to draw your crossfades appropriately, make sure none of these breaths are cut off, no double breaths are happening. It's a pretty tedious process to comp vocals on most DAWs. But what I love about Logic is that they've thought ahead and they've made a feature on this DAW that's called Take Folders. So what you would do is highlight all your vocals or whatever you're comping, right click, go down to Folder, and right here, Pack Take Folder. Here at the top, is a representation of the master comp. So if you look up here at the top, as I highlight another one of these tracks, you'll see it changes. So at the top, it shows you your main comp and the process has become much simpler. And bonus feature, if you look up at the top, anywhere that, there, that you have this line, it already draws a crossfade in for you automatically. So another one of my favorite features about Logic is called Flex Time. And other DAWs or other applications call it Elastic Audio. And if you don't know what that is, it basically simplifies the process of editing the timing of notes or beats or whatever event you have in whatever audio region you have. So rather than talk too much about it, I'll just show you how it works here. I love the way Logic does it. It's so intuitive. So highlight your drum track. Command F is the hotkey. You'll see this little hourglass pop up. Click it. It'll analyze the track and give you transient, transient suggestions. And generally for editing the timing of things, you wanna zoom way in so you can see the grid lines. And I'll show you how fast this is. Click, drag, click, drag. You can just do it visually. Let's say for um, the purposes of this song, we want the drums really locked in in time. We want it dead on to the, to the grid. That's not always what you want, but let's just say that that's what we want on this track. I do this all by hand generally too. You can do it automatically, but I find I get better results if I do it by hand. Take the extra time and do it. I highly recommend it. Okay, that one's locked in. I'll give you a bar of pre-roll and you'll hear it. Boom. 
My name's Chad Gendison, and I'm a producer and songwriter out of Los Angeles. I write and produce for Universal Music Group, as well as a bunch of different bands. But today, we're going to feature a band out of Texas called Messer. These guys are going to be featured on a DAW that I've been using for about 20 years. So it's a digital performer. It's got little tricks and, and things that I love about it. It's a very musical DAW, in my opinion. And uh, we'll get into the sequence and show you guys some stuff. So one of the big things that... Uh, I love about DP is just after using it for 20 years, it's kind of like a, a second skin for me. I want to be able to create and just do what I want to do with it. And I mean, I started out with these guys, uh, I think it was DP 2.4, like back in 2000 one or two maybe or something like that. It was, it was crazy. There's kind of a cool thing that digital performer has called chunks and chunks is the ability to basically, so say you're looking at the screen here and you have like, your entire sequence in here right and it's mixed and it's automated and you've got all this stuff going on you can actually save this to a chunk and open it you can literally have and do automation and different plugins and all of this other stuff uh so say you have a radio edit of this song so we do a radio edit we do a shortened version we do the 10 the 60 whatever for placements it's really cool because then you can switch to a different chunk you can have different processing plugins and what's really efficient about it is that digital performer references the original audio files so even if you cut this down and arrange it differently on a different chunk it'll all kind of reference the same stuff so it's super super efficient and you can have i mean with a modern computer or even i think mine's a 2012 like cheese grater fairly old in tech but i can have almost unlimited chunks in a sequence okay so uh one of my cool tricks with digital performer that i love so much and i hope they never like change this is uh their spectral effects what I like to do with this is I'll take like a lead vocal after comping, after tuning, I'll do that. And what's so great about this thing is it's really wonderfully kind of broken in a way. You'd have to use like maybe three other plugs to get this sound. It'll pitch it down. And, and Digital Performer has uh, this proprietary pitching algorithm called ZTX. They like licensed it. It's this incredible algorithm. It does polyphonic shifting. And it, if you want perfect, that's it. Um, but this just kind of has this ability to make like a low vocal or a low octave vocal just kind of sound a little bit kind of sucked out, distorted, compressed. And it kind of adds this like little roughness under it. So now if I just solo this low vocal... I struggle with the hate of the world. Yeah, I mean, it's like. I think it's such a shame. Sometimes it's hard to shine. Not exactly sure what you'd call it, but it's just kind of one of those things that I love about this program. And I pray that they never fix it because, like I said, I'm sure you could recreate it in a couple of different plugins or with some other outside plugin, but it's just great with this one. This is kind of a little secret weapon I have here. I love this Echo, man. It's just this weird multipole ADT delay. It just has an interesting, interesting effect on vocals. So if I like solo the vocals for you, you can hear this. See what I mean? It's just an ultra short delay, but a lot of times that I'll use that with anything that kind of needs space in a mix. It helps give like width and depth and carves out room for the rest of your mix. Man, sometimes when you're working in a DAW and your eyes get tired and you know, you guys know what I'm talking about, like 16 hour days, um, your ears aren't working anymore, but you need to edit. You need to use your eyes for stuff. Uh, Digital Performer has different themes. You can literally kind of like preview a little bit like what's happening here on the bottom right. I'm on the producer, I'm on the producer setting because, you know, there's sometimes when it's just when your eyes need a break. So you double click on this, it changes the whole theme. Look at that. Boom. It's green. Tron. Yeah, whatever that look is. I think they even have like a wood green. See, nice and classy. So, you know, if you have nice people over and you want to bring out the china, then you put on the wood grain and everybody just feels super comfortable. You know what I mean? The themes... Are, are fun and now i'm going to change it back to my producer setting because you know okay now i can't see it i'm blind there we go
I got to have my glasses, my shoes and my glasses, so I'll have them. Hey, my name is Joe Gilder from Home Studio Corner, and I've been using Presonus Studio One for 12 years. Golly, that's a long time. Uh, I never intended to switch, but I started using it just on the side just to check it out, and it completely won me over. I had used Logic and Pro Tools and had no qualms with them, but there was something about Studio One that made my life easier, made my workflow faster, and I couldn't look back once I tried it. First thing that really won me over was the integration between mixing and mastering. Let me show you. This is the song page. This is the song that I'm working on with my band for a new EP. And let's say I come in here and I make some changes to the vocal volume and the keyboard volume. And then I save this, okay? Stick with me. Next, I'm gonna open up the project that I've created for this EP. So the song page is for recording and mixing, the project page is for mastering. When I open up the project page for this EP, I get this window that says, well, looks like this song has been updated since the last time you opened this project file. Would you like us to update the mix? And I say, well, of course, Studio One, thank you. Studio One proceeds to go open that song render down the latest mix down and drop it in place of the previous one inside of that project page. It's like having your own assistant in the studio that goes and renders all your mixes for you while you eat a sandwich. Plus, you get a nice mastering suite with lots of nice big meters as well. The second thing that won me over to Studio One was this sneaky little editing tool. I do a lot of drum editing, and historically it would go something like this. I would cut up the drums, and I would slide this one back, and then there would be a gap, and I'd have to fill in the gap, right? It, the tedious process, but a lot of folks have been there. Studio One made this a lot easier. By holding down Command and Option, I can just drag the underlying audio around as far as I want without the edges of this particular event moving. So once I get it exactly where I want, I can press X to crossfade it. I can see here that the snare went a little too far over, so I can bring that back and also press X again to create a crossfade. And the third thing was how intuitive and fast Studio One was for me. Let's say I want to solo the drums. In other systems, I've had to do something like either just clicking on the solo button on each of the pieces of the kit or selecting them all and adding a group for them, turning that group on, and then pressing solo. But in Studio One, I just have to come to the bus that they're feeding into and press solo. It'll automatically solo anything that's feeding that bus. I can even just press the S button on my keyboard to turn solo on and off. Same for mute, and also the same for record enable. Also, there's a simple grouping feature in Studio One that means I rarely use like proper groups anymore. If I want to take all of these faders and turn them up and down, I just have to select them and move the fader and they all move together. Same thing with panning, same thing with solo, same thing with mute. They're all just temporarily grouped while they're selected and as soon as I click away, they're no longer grouped. Let me give you a bit of background about me and Pro Tools. I started using Pro Tools in 1990-something. I think it was 3.8 for those of you that are good at that. So I feel like it was 97, 98, quite a long time ago. You've got to bear in mind when Pro Tools was around then, it was the only game in town for doing the kinds of things that I loved and I needed. And what I needed from Pro Tools was the ability to edit audio quickly and effectively. I do think, quite frankly, they got it right first time when it comes to editing audio. If you look at the screen here, and I just flick between the two of this, this look essentially has not changed. And other people have adopted this look. I mean, I know it's pretty logical, but a full screen just for editing, a full screen just for mixing, makes a lot of sense to me. I've tried other DAWs where they have like the editing at the top and then the mix below. And that's all fantastic for some people. But for my brain, I need a dedicated place like this. So if I decide to say, let's just go through the bass and drums and let's just give it a listen. So that was on top. So there was a beat there on top. So it's just a little ahead. Well, you heard it, you heard it just kind of, now I can just, Tab to the transient, highlight the area, and just push it back. Simple as that. You can nudge it, you can drag it back, you can snap it to a grid. It doesn't mean that it's gridded, because what I often do with the grid is I use it as a reference point. So if I want it to be behind or on top, 
I just cut the audio file so that it lands in the position that I want to be. It's instinctive. I've been doing this for years, so I can edit super, super quick. And that capability was a big deal for me as a guitar player. I would work with keyboard players who would be programming all day and then just highlight in MIDI and just quantize the whole thing so it was all perfectly in time. And me as a guitar player was trying to play with a keyboard part and drum program part that was like, like completely and utterly, you know, edited to with, with an inch of its life. Now, I don't use Pro Tools as such to edit exactly. I use it where I hear something wrong, like I heard there. And to me, it is still incredibly intuitive for audio editing. Now, it may have shortcomings in other areas, but I spend most of my life, not all of my life, but most of my life working with organic instruments. So for me, it's perfect for that. So to reiterate, for me, the mix of you and the editing window are two separate things. So I personally love the fact that I've got an edit window and a mix window. And I don't get me wrong, I can stay on this window here and do both because of course you can access everything here. Like if I want to draw in automation, for instance, I can just go to volume here and draw in like this. You know, I can, I can do fun things like clip gain. For instance, if we go to clip gain here, go back to waveform, you see this note's pretty quiet. It's a low note and it's very, very down. So I'll just go in there and grab the clip gain and bring it up. There you go. It's fantastic for vocals, clip gain. So you see Lily's vocal here is very, very dynamic. So I could just go in and take sections like this, just separate them and gain them up. I could do this through the whole vocal. One of the things I love with clip gain is actually going to the ends of phrases. So if we just solo Lily on her own for a second. Oh, bleeding, lost my... I love that. Lost, lost, lost. The, uh, at the end. So I could just go in, separate that, turn it up, and just put a nice big fat fade. And now, lost my... lost. I got a little cry, I've exaggerated it. So there's lots of great shortcuts in Pro Tools. I can highlight a region, I can press B and separate it out. There are old school ones that I've known for decades, which is like using the Apple or Command as it's now known. It used to have an Apple logo on there for those of you who remember back in the 90s. And I can select all my tools up here. If you go up to here, you'll see I go Apple one, two, three, four, and five. So I go, well, even six, and I can select all the different tools. Some people like the smart tool, which is a tool that incorporates three of, or four of those, and you just position it differently on the waveform. I don't, I'm old school. I don't mind using my left hand. I know some people can edit and just do everything like one-handed with their right hand like this. Me, I like the articulation of both things together. It's a very, very intuitive audio editing software. And there's a reason why it's popular and it's predominantly based on that. Now, obviously, as a mixer, it's fantastic as well. So many huge, huge albums have been mixed in the box using Pro Tools. Now, it doesn't mean that all of these other ones aren't also you know, being used in that way. Of course they are. It's just Pro Tools has been around for long enough. And let's not forget, it was so much further along than everybody else for quite a few years that it has established itself as a kind of standard. Now, that always starts off some kind of fight when you would use the word standard. But it is something that when you go to a professional studio, a, a large format console studio, you will find Pro Tools in there. It's not to say they might not also have Logic, sometimes Cubase, of course, which is incredibly popular in Europe, but they will have Pro Tools in there because most, not all, but most engineers will know it. Um, again, just to reiterate, it's all about the audio editing capabilities for me. So thanks ever so much for watching. Of course, whatever DAW you choose, and there's many and we're only scratching the surface, can also be based on your computer. Logic, of course, is an Apple product. So it runs on, you guessed it, Apple 
products, where something like Reaper and many others are PC based. And then of course, a lot of the companies have versions for both platforms. I personally predominantly use Apple products. However, I do own PCs as well. We edit our videos on PCs. My son has a gaming computer, which is maxed out. Again, a PC. There's a lot of PCs in my life as well. And I have no real opinion. I just know Apple products, so I use them and I love them. But if you're a PC based person, of course, there are plenty of software DAWs available to you on PC. So thanks ever so much for watching. Hope you really appreciate it. Please leave us um, any comments and questions below. And I'd love to hear what you think. What DAW do you use and why do you use it? Thanks ever so much. So long, farewell, avidezen, au revoir, adios, goodbye.